Uh, service provision is a very, very good kind of economic position to be in, because you retain the thing yourself. Okay, so there's this cultural level. Uh, cultural level can be measured in terms of degrees and diplomas. You're very aware of this because you're paying a lot of money to get your degree or diploma. But there's also a symbolic economy at work. The symbolic capital is prestige, basically. For example, I know, I'm going to stop this video right here, I know and you know that you don't get a lot of skills and competencies here. I mean, you have a great time, I hope, and you work really hard for two years, but, but you know, you knew your languages when you came in. You get a few things. And what you're buying is really the prestige of that bit of paper. I mean, otherwise, how could you justify paying so much money? But, but it's good. It's a good investment because it's incredibly prestigious. And you can flash that in certain cir circumstances to certain employers or, or a network of alumni, which exists here, and exchange it for a very good job and get the economic capital. And you recuperate your investment. It doesn't matter that you don't have the cultural capital. It doesn't matter you don't know how to translate it. Well, perhaps I... No. I correct that. I'm going to stop that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how well you can translate. What you have bought is prestige. And what you exchange is prestige. Some countries, some cultures operate very much on the symbolic level. In Europe, if I ask somebody about their studies, I'd say, what kind of degree have you got? And they say, oh, I studied law, or I studied medicine, or I studied translation. In the, okay, so I've got cultural capital in those fields. If I ask people here, or they volunteer, you don't have to ask people here, they'll tell you straight off. And they tell you how much they earn, I don't know. No, I have a doctorate from Harvard. I have a doctorate from here. It doesn't matter what field it's in, it matters what university it's from. What institution? What matters is the prestige and not the cultural capital. The symbolic capital is more powerful in this economy than the cultural capital. In the Europe I'm used to, it's the reverse. We're really interested in what we can do, and then we might be interested in where you got the degree from. Uh, basically because the role of the state in universities is far more developed in Europe. We don't have the big private universities which are the best in the world. Beyond that, there is a social economy. <coughs> this is what my mother used to tell me. She was right. She said, it doesn't matter what you know. What matters is not what you know, it's who you know. Okay. You can be an idiot. You can have no prestigious degrees at all. And you can have no money. But you might know the president. United States very well, and you'll get a good job. President of any other country except the United States. I'm not correct. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Okay. There is an economy of social relations, of social value that is exchanged. It doesn't matter what you can do, it matters who you know. And often, what family or social caste you're born into. Okay? Uh, you work on these networks. Sometimes you can exchange your social prestige, your social capital, for cultural capital. You get into a good university very easily. Okay? And then you get that and you immediately get the symbolic capital as well and that together can ensure you a reasonably comfortable life, getting a good salary, even though you're a complete idiot. Aristocracies, feudal societies work almost exclusively on social and symbolic levels. The bourgeoisie, the middle classes, 
have owed their rise to cultural capital. Okay, capitalism, the businessmen who developed it, uh, uh, give prestige, privacy to economic capital for obvious reasons. <coughs> for most of us here, we think the only thing that really matters is cultural capital. But I assure you, there are many other people out there who value other kinds of capital much more. Now, why is that interesting? Firstly, it makes it much more complicated. When people say, oh, but literary translators don't get paid very much. Oh, poor old literary translators. Well, why do they do it then? Why are you such a fool to go and translate this great novel if you're not going to get paid for the time you spent doing it? You think, oh, I'm an altruistic soul. I did it for the love of art. <laughs> or it's my contribution to culture. I don't know. All this rubbish that comes out. But if you look at it in these terms, no. Most of these people are academics. They translate. If I come in and I'm the translator of, who do you want to be a translator of into English? Translator of Borges in Spanish, okay? Or you pick the greatest novelist in your language and you think, I'm the translator of. Prestigious, okay, symbolic, capital, all right. And you can exchange that for a teaching position and publish about the problems of translating it. And then you're exchanging it for economic capital. And then you get a job in a good university and social networking uh, uh, brings it on and, uh, and you develop a, a social network and you get more and more uh, prestigious contacts. You can translate more novelists and perhaps the publishers will start to pay attention and pay you better for your translations. Perhaps, or if not. But the rise to success in that particular field is not just in terms of an economic economy, a financial economy. The rise to the success usually depends on the social and the symbolic and the cultural working together more so than uh, the financial. Bourdieu's analysis, he did an analysis of the French publishing industry, really as a publishing industry, he wasn't particularly concerned with translation, so it, though it does appear here. You can't see the map, but I'll just explain basically what happens. He found you have some very big publishers up here who employ lots of people and carry very few translations, and some big publishers down here who carry a few translations and they buy best sellers. There's this economy. We're talking about literature here. There's a, a world economy. If it's a best seller in English or one of the major languages, it will be sold for a high price into the other languages. Harry Potter, boom. Easy to sell, easy to organize the translation. And that will happen out here, down here actually, among the major publishers interested in carrying translations. and they will have their trusted or in-house translators. But most of the translations are happening down here at the other end, and these are very small translations, very small companies. <coughs> these big ones are in Paris, these ones are in the south of France, Provence. These ones employ hundreds of people, these usually employ one, two or three people, it's usually one woman who's in charge of it, with a few friends. And the translators out here will be paid very correctly, and the work has to be trusted and revised in-house. Here, there are networks of people who love literature, and who translate almost for free, if not entirely for free. Here, it's an economic economy that prevails. Down here, it's purely cultural, symbolic, and social. Often, they do it for the love of working together. Big authors, big bestsellers are out here, Nobel Prizes. Here, usually the translators know the foreign authors and are trying to promote them, which is why they do it. Okay. And they have a good time. This might also explain why it is that Facebook, most famously Facebook, can get localized for free. Or why people translate for free on Wikipedia. Or TED, the TED videos are dubbed, uh, subtitled, for free. 
Why are so many people translating for nothing? We're here to make it a high, pay, highly paid, highly respected profession. No, they have good fun. It's social networking. They learn with each other. You know, lots of other economies are happening there within translation. It's like singing. Some people love to get together to sing. They have good fun. It's a social event. People use translation that way. Probably down there. Okay? And then we have opera singers, rock stars, who are paid a lot to sing. Okay? And it's just a completely different economy that's working. <coughs> Some of the research that's been carried out um, around these concepts. You know, there are many people doing many different things. Uh, I'll just, just name a few. Uh, Austrian researcher Michaela Wolf uh, did a study of uh, women's publishing houses in Germany and Austria. And she found, most remarkably, that uh, many, many people are translating their women, translating women's literature for pure uh, social prestige, social capital. Uh, because they want to contribute to the cause, and, and, and it's a social network. That they're getting paid very little, but they keep doing it. They're not crazy, because they get a lot out of it personally in their, in their lives. They also learn through translating, and that would be cultural capital playing a role there. Um, so when Kuhn... Did her doctorate at Newcastle, she's now gone to New Zealand. Anyway, uh, she did a, a lovely study on um, a book of uh, Chinese literature, Taiwanese literature, at Columbia University Press, the, the series, a series of novels translated there. And she tried to figure out how it happened that these translators came together, that the project got underway. And she discovered that the key thing was networking. Just one person called David Wang uh, set up an interest on the part of the Taiwan government connected with the president of Colombia. He knew a lot of translators including our good friend uh, Dr. Balcom here. And through this networking, not through a lot of money, but through networking and social prestige and, and uh, I guess getting people involved in the, in the cause, uh, they got uh, a prestigious series of novels translated into English. Not for financial reasons. My study of the Quran was quite different. And this is the 1143 translation. The, uh, the Latin translators felt very bad about translating the, the, the religious text of the opposition. And so in the prefaces it's made very, very clear that they were paid a lot of money. Uh, this, he said, I handled this vile material, uh, uh, but only because it was rewarded in gold. And he said, I, I tried to turn this stuff into gold, but was unable to do so. Yeah. The money was incredibly important. Uh, it was important to the translators there not to be associated with the source culture, not to have any implication of social relations, of, of cultural capital, anything like that, the money made them trustworthy. Yeah? I took the money from the abbot of Cluny, the abbot of uh, Cluny's in France, but he's controlling the show, therefore I'm on that side. So it's entirely the opposite. At least in its presentation in the prefaces. I'm probably going too far to get into that stuff. I'll leave, I'll leave that one. Oh, no, I won't. Yeah, uh, Nietzsche being translated. I was, I'm very interested. I spent two years working on translations between German and French in the 1890s and, and into the 1900s. Uh, because I, I became convinced that the United States of Europe, that was proposed in 1893, and uh, France and Germany understood each other pretty well, and uh, they were talking about getting together and forming the United States of Europe, believe it or not. And then the French turned against the Germans and suddenly didn't like them. And I was interested in why, what happened? And then you went towards the First World War, 
profitable? Uh, there are many reasons, but one of them is a, a spate of translations. Firstly of Wagner, and then of Nietzsche. And uh, Nietzsche was uh, translated first by Henri Albert as a sort of lost Frenchman, somebody who had the misfortune to be born in Germany, uh, this thing he was supposed to be of Polish ancestry, not a real German at all, he was a professor in Basel in Switzerland, so not really German. And he was somebody who should have been writing in French, but just by accident happened to be in German. And he was translated in a way that was very palatable to the French. Okay? As a critique of Germany. So I simplify a lot, but the, 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 the German ideas of people, the French people could see that the only interesting thing coming out of Germany, above Wagner, were criticisms of Germany. And so it was very easy to push themselves away from that. Now, Henri Albert was uh, born in Strasbourg. Strasbourg is between France, it's in France now, but at the time it belonged to Germany. It was in the Reichsland. So it, it's a bit that in history has gone backwards and forwards. So a bilingual region, speak German, speak French, speak Strasbourgeois as well, they have their own language around there. And uh, he was in the ideal position to mediate between the two cultures. This perfect intermediary, intermediary character. He, he, he translated Nietzsche, he wrote in the French uh, literary journals. He also wrote in German about French literature on the other side. He was going both ways, could have done it really well. But at this period, he decided he was going to become completely French. He moved to Paris. He started to criticize not just the Germans, but also people from Strasbourg who could not be trusted in this intermediary uh, uh, position, and made himself more French than the French, as converts typically do. And I blame him, that creative translator, partly for the First World War and the delay of the United States of Europe. All right. Just an idea of some of the things that can be happening there and some of the things that interest me. I'm interested in these, this is just to finish up, okay? In going through many, many case studies, I've, I have no final conclusions, but I've got some hunches, which would be hypotheses. I find that translators, if they get prestige in that economy, the symbolic economy, it's not because of how well they translate, usually, is because they do other things, like teach, do politics, write. I think that in some places there are these professional intercultures, although I've started to revise my opinions on that. The more technical the translators, the more they are interested in exchange for financial value. Okay. And the less technical, the more the other economies come to play. And especially literary translators, which tend to exchange cultural capital, their knowledge of literature and of languages, for symbolic capital, okay, prestige, and then exchange that for other things in other institutions. It might be in the church, it might be in the university system, it might be teaching, it might be in, literary, in publishing. And for that reason, I suspect that it's misleading to talk about the sociology of all translators, or the economy of translation. Uh, I'm finding that the more I investigate particular case studies, the more, or the, the, the clearer it is, that what happens with translations depends on the other fields where people are working. Depends on the university system, the intergovernmental organization that you might be working for, uh, the politics of, of particular governments. Uh, it, it's false, I think, to pretend that there is just one sociology for translators or even one cultural identity for translators. We are wandering in and out of intercultural spaces like the one we're in now. <laughs>